Some of you are about to be really mad at me, but I don't care because I'm here to tell you that Midnight's does not deserve Album of the Year. Yes, this is a Swifty channel, but I have an unpopular opinion to share and an argument to make. Taylor Swift's 10th studio album, Midnight's, does not deserve to win Album of the Year at the 2024 Grammys. The reasons for this are honestly tenfold. In my opinion, it doesn't really pass muster with the bar of artistic excellence, a key decisioning factor in what does eventually win. And I believe it's only in the running by the sheer and brute force of Taylor mania and the extraordinary year she had in 2023. Now make no mistake, I love this record. I love all her records. I'm literally wearing a Midnight's cardigan right now as we speak. But I don't think it's useful nor fair to other artists to endlessly praise Taylor Swift to the highest degree simply just for being successful. The main pushback that I receive when I say stuff like this is, oh, but Midnight sold so and so and it achieved X and Y. And commercial success is basically irrelevant to Taylor Swift's discography when we're talking about measuring its artistic excellence and quality. Commercial success for her at this point is a given. No matter what she puts out, it's going to succeed and surpass anything she's done before or the other products on the market. And Midnight's is a great example of that because I truly believe that whatever album Taylor would have put out at this particular juncture in her career, right as she was on the precipice of doing a you know groundbreaking world tour, I think it would have had the same impact. It has nothing to do with the actual quality of Midnight's itself. Taylor has also won album of the year thrice already for albums that were way more deserving of this accolade than Midnight's. The messaging of her Grammy campaign this year as well seems to be around tying Midnight's subliminally to the Eras tour, which is a smart psychological voter positioning move to get people to award her for being successful rather than for the work being excellent, because I don't think this work stands up on its own as an excellent example of Taylor Swift's songwriting. Taylor is the kind of artist that truly benefits from losing stuff and getting criticism because she encounters it so infrequently. I know that we have this like victim narrative in our head that we've built up for Taylor and there have certainly been instances where she's been received and treated unfairly but by and large she's received critical acclaim and massive commercial success. It does her no damage to challenge her to excel and to hone her craft to become better. Each and every album right up until around midnight actually was made in response to some form of criticism that was lobbied against Taylor Swift and my main reasons for why Midnight's is not artistically excellent are there will be no enduring career highlights from this record as it ages. Yes I'm going to explain why. The songwriting is confused and non-specific, mirroring her mental state in the process of making this record. It does absolutely nothing new from any of her pop records before it, and also Midnight's was a calculated, safe move to re-enter her main pop girl era after a period of folksy reclusivity, and also to hard launch the Eras tour. The main purpose of this record was really to drum up excitement for that tour, and I'm really certain of that, and even more certain after revisiting the album yet again and trying to understand why people think that this actually deserves the highest accolade of the music industry in 2024. And again, that's not to say that this isn't a good record. I love many songs on this record. I have really enjoyed listening to it. I just don't think that it's deserving of an album of the year accolade, especially given the caliber of work surrounding Midnight's in this category. With career highlights from SZA, Lana, Boy Genius, and yes, Olivia Rodrigo, Midnight's is certainly not the best or even the second best album in this category, nor is it even Taylor Swift's best album to begin with. At any point in time, I could argue that her three album of the year for Fearless, Folklore, and 1989 were each given to albums that signified the pinnacle of her achievements of artistic and commercial excellence. And I could make that argument for each of them right now. In fact, I will in just a second. But I would be stumped to try and make that case for Midnight's. I could only do it by associating it with the Eras Tour. So anyway, in today's video, I'll be going through my standard categories for assessing an album of the year, which I've been doing so far on this month. It is Grammy month on Swiftologist. I have done Lana Del Rey's Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, Olivia Rodrigo's Gut, and I will be rounding off with SZA's SOS at the end of this month. But the categories that I've used to kind of assess all of these contenders is artistic excellence. How has it pushed the artist to grow? How has it challenged their creative skills? Has it shown a new side of them? The cultural impact of the record? What kind of splash did it make with the critics? Did it resonate widely with the audience? And a little bit of hypothesizing on what kind of legacy each record is going to leave behind. So I will be getting into all of that today as well as going through Taylor's Grammy history because I think that that is a pertinent and interesting thing to discover as we talk about this year album of the year nominees. But before we get into the nonsense, I'm going to need to cleanse myself with a blessed scent. And today's blessed scent is Wonderstruck by Taylor Swift. Heard of it? Hard to find, hard to get. And speaking of perfumes, I want to say a big thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. 
Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. I am a huge fragrance head and I am always so tempted to blow all of my money on big full-size bottles only to realize after a couple of wears that I'm actually really not into what I just blew a couple of hundred dollars on. And you don't have to invest a lot of money on designer fragrances if you try Scentbird because Scentbird offers affordable and flexible subscription plans. You can also skip or cancel your subscription at any point which makes it the ultimate flexible and hassle-free experience. And every month you get to pick what you want to receive so there are no surprises. You're not gonna get something disgusting in the mail by accident. And they have over 600 perfumes and colognes and a lot of unisex options with brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of Rebel. So you know whether you're going for one of the big names or an indie label that you're getting a premium scent each month. You gotta smell good to look good, okay? I truly do believe that. Your scent can change the aura of the room that you walk into and, you know, give you a presence that goes beyond just what you're able to say or visually communicate. Each day gives you a 30-day support Apply so that you can try out all of these fragrances that you're considering or mulling over, dipping your toes into before fully committing to a bottle. And that can start at like 150 bucks and easily go to 300 and $500 when you get into those super luxury indie scents. If you're not sure what kind of scent profile you like, or if you're totally new to the world of fragrance, there's also a quiz on their website that will help you find a scent that is perfectly suited to your desires. They even have my signature scent, which I kind of don't want to put you guys onto because I feel like too many people wear it already, but it's Tom Ford Black Orchid. I love the scent so much. I in Tokyo all the time. It is a perfect cold weather scent. So it's winter time. If you live in a cold place, you need to check this out. With that being said, use code Swiftologist to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. And thank you again, Scentbird, for sponsoring this video. I will leave all the links that you need in my description box and in the comments down below. So Taylor's Grammy history. She is a Grammy darling. Like we simply have been knowing that. She does everything that the Grammys want you to do, which is kowtow to them, kiss the ring, perform at the award shows, publicly talk up what an incredible accolade they are to achieve. So what's keeping you busy? these days? Uh, I'm just working out and getting ready for Grammys. What's the most exciting thing in life right now? Grammys? She also extensively lobbies for her Grammy, submitting lavish for your consideration freebies, not bribes. We must point that out because she's been accused of that in the past, but you know, persuasions. For example, when she was trying to get reputation nominated in the big categories, she sent the voters the VIP tour reputation boxes. She's taken out billboards and she's run full page ads in the LA Times that literally verbatim said, Taylor Swift has never won song of the year. Vote for lover. This is when Lover was nominated for Song of the Year. I mean, it's transparent. She thirsts. She wants. I mean, just 10 years ago to this very day that I'm recording, she was walking through a Whole Foods wearing a Grammy necklace. This was right before Red lost Album of the Year, so I guess the incantations don't work every time. These things that I've just mentioned to you are expensive. A billboard can cost upwards of $15,000. Extravagant wooing and reminding the voters of your existence is certainly a privilege left to the most advantaged artists with the deep pockets and or labels that are willing to shell out the extra pennies. Grammy wins also typically boost album sales and help tours too and they connect newer artists with industry veterans exposing them to new opportunities and giving them a bit of a vote of confidence beyond just topping the charts and having commercial success it's like having your peers stand up around you and say you know what i know what the process of making music is like it's really hard and i'm going to give you a gold star because you did a really good job and we know that our pathological people pleaser one ms taylor swift is driven more than anything by applause but overall the main thing that i always tried to be was like a good girl so we know what Taylor gets out of this, but what do the Grammys get out of awarding Taylor? A lot if not more than Taylor gets from winning one. If they're lucky and they nominate her splendidly, they get her attendance, which is invaluable to any award show. You'll notice that basically every award show in this day and age has a dedicated Taylor Swift cam. If they're really lucky, the Grammys might get a performance out of her, though it's been some time since she's actually done that. And then if she wins, they get effusive praise from her followers and many think pieces generated online as well, free promotion, engagement online skyrockets overall, and what the Grammys need more than ever. <laughs> and what only Taylor Swift basically can give them at this point and what they've been hemorrhaging for many years is relevancy. For years, artists like Drake and The Weeknd have called out perceived Grammy bias and their unwillingness to diversify the way that the Grammys do their nomination process. And they've been so frustrated by this that each of them have at one point or another stopped submitting their work for consideration at all. Taylor Swift, crucially, now the biggest tastemaker in the music industry, has never lobbed such critiques at the Grammys, nor downplayed her achievements. She's very friendly with the Recording Academy. She's hosted listening parties for them. She's met voters 
hours personally and held intimate performances. And, you know, subsequently, she's one of only four artists to win Album of the Year three times, and she has 11 Grammys in total. Interestingly, she's never won for a Song of the Year, which is apparently a sore spot for her, given how hard she's campaigned for it as of late. But I think it is inevitable at this point that whenever Taylor releases, she's going to get nominations for each and every album. And part of that is totally deserved. She's an incredible songwriter. Bar debut, she's had nominations for each and every one of her albums. What usually pushes her into a big category nomination, which is one of the big four awards of the evening, Record of the Year, Song of the Year, Best New Artist, or Album of the Year, what pushes her into those very prestigious categories is what I would call excellent. Some albums are good, some albums are great, some albums are very important, but not all albums are excellent. Excellence is a special sauce that is honestly subjective, so take my words with a grain of salt, this is just my opinion, but the only albums of hers that have actually received Album of the Year nominations are Fearless, Red, 1989, Folklore, Evermore, and now Midnight's. One of these records is not like the other. Sneak alert, why don't we start with cultural impact? I think that this is a good place to start given the era's hubbub, and I think that this is what is confusing people into thinking that Midnight's is actually a deserving entry of Album of the Year. So this record, as I mentioned at the top of this video, no matter what, was always going to be huge. She was cruising off of years of public goodwill, mystique, and hunger for big pop moments post-pandemic, and also her re-emergence into the pop landscape after her general turn away from the upbeat sing-along bangers that made her universally popular in the first place and I think that this moment that Midnight's arrived in is a really important thing to keep in mind because the cultural impact of this album is not purely because of its artistic merit it's a culmination of factors and watch my Taylor Mania video for more information on how exactly that came to be the rollout of this record was like edging. It was sexual almost. It was hype building to the max. Kept under lock and key, we got very mysterious song titles in a torturous TikTok series called Midnight's Mayhem with Me, and pretty much absolutely no other information about the record until it arrived. Withholding is a very powerful marketing tool that most pop stars don't have the leverage to use, so kudos to Taylor Swift for being able to do that, and it was certainly a very exciting time to be a Swifty. Intrigue was also fueled by Taylor's self-professed return to her core competency and the biggest driver of intrigue in her music, the T, her personal life, confessional and diaristic songwriting, hot off the heels of Taylor's version where fans excitedly revisited her prior work through a new lens and with more information from the vault tracks, the people wanted more of the juice. And can you blame them? I'm the people. I'm the people. I always want more juice. She played into this intrigue, though, with the branding and the marketing of this record very deliberately. Her tagline was, Midnight's, the stories of 13 sleepless nights scattered throughout my life, will be out on October 21st. The implication that this return to pop would be, one, darker, edgier, and somehow more serious than her other pop records, and two, deeply confessional after turning to fiction for three years, was an exciting premise. Ultimately, one that she didn't really succeed at following through. When the record came out, it, of course, immediately immediately surpassed everything that had come before it in terms of first week performance. The sheer amount of variations of this record for sure played a role in this reception as well with the vinyl collectibles, the cassettes, and the very many CD variations. But that doesn't negate the fact that people were seated for this Taylor Swift event. She topped her own record for most records sold in a day. She logged another million plus debut week performance and the whole record charted in the top 40. She released an additional six songs six hours later called the 3 a.m. edition. It was a moment. We can't lie about that. This was the beginning of her hyper-productive, hyper-generative era. And I think that's kind of a problem when it comes to her autobiographical writing. But again, we'll get into that. So the lead single is Antihero, which was clearly written to be number one, a hit, and number two, a TikTok song. That doesn't negate the fact that it's a good song and is super fun to sing along with. I think it might actually be her most consistent chart hit to date. That is definitely due to interest, but also due to several chart manipulations that forced it into that number one spot for more weeks than it would have stayed there organically. There's lots of chatter these days about gaming the charts and does it matter. And I think that when we're evaluating the cultural impact of a record, we need to know what the people were actually like really bumping and listening to and liking, not just how was the artist galvanizing their legions of fans in order to gamify the charts and stay at the top longer. Like, is that truly a real indication of what people are listening to? I don't know. I haven't really quite parsed that one out yet. But even though there were some manipulations at hand. I will never contest that Antihero is a giant hit. The visuals for this record were somewhat deceiving, I would say. They definitely signaled a darker, more singer songwriter vibe, and yet Midnight's kind of surprised everyone by being, well, not really a surprise at all. <laughs> it is your bog-standard, run-of-the-mill Jack and Taylor collaboration. It is very good, and often very successful at being very good. However, it's nowhere near excellent. 
Taylor herself was very confused in the process of creating this record, but we can also see her dithering on the visuals themselves. The color palettes for the music videos were drab, dull, and really lackluster, and we also failed to have an iconic era-defining visual. The one that immediately comes to mind is her smashing the koi fish guitar, but again, that's like nostalgia bait. It's not a new image. It's no willow in the gold box. It's no clinging onto the piano in a stormy sea. The Bejeweled music video was complete and utter nonsense. Lavender Haze was pretty, but it lacked substance, and the anti-hero video was just way too ham-fisted. Taylor doesn't have an excellent track record with visuals in my opinion, but the kind of nothingness, the emptiness of these offerings definitely kind of underscored the middling quality of the record and the era itself, and the over-reliance on Easter eggs definitely signals to me that there isn't a lot of depth to actually mine. It's style over substance. The cultural impact of Midnight's is also completely inseparable from the era's tour. About a week later, she announced this retrospective journey through her entire career, her biggest and most ambitious project to date, and she didn't even really need to promote the record after this. She didn't need to give interviews or do live performance. The Taylor Swift machine at this point did it all for her. It was this lack of participation with the audience as well that I think made this record feel half-hearted. My hunch is that Midnight's really was just a vehicle to generate hype and excitement for the Eras tour and to remind us that Taylor Swift is the pop star. And that's totally all well and good, but that's not a good enough reason for it to win Album of the Year. And Taylor knows that, which is why all of her Grammy for Your Consideration materials are centered around tour visuals and the stunning year that she's had thanks to her newfound intergalactic visibility. The critical reception to Midnight's, if you really read the reviews, is lukewarm to positive. It, at this day and age, Kim Jong Swift, people are scared of saying anything critical about Taylor Swift because, you know, the Swifties attack and it's not a pleasant place to be in. There are a couple of journalists, I think, that have gone on the record and said that they have no interest in writing about Taylor Swift because they're afraid of the pushback. Other critics have noticed critics' reticence to be critical at all towards her. There isn't anything even really glaringly terrible about this record to comment on per se, but there's also nothing to wax poetic about and absolutely no career highlights when it's compared to the two albums that immediately preceded it, Folklore and Evermore. And yes, the progression of her albums does matter. We must take into account what came before a record in order to understand what journey she went on to create the new one and how she developed her skill. Think about the quality jump in the songwriting from Lover to Folklore and Evermore. Then think about the quality jump in songwriting from Folklore and Evermore to Midnight's. It feels like a regression. Where's the growth? Where's the excellence? But anyway, as I mentioned, critics are generally too scared to deliver anything less than a glowing review for Taylor Swift these days. They are just straight up not mentioning glaring things like glitches in the 1989 TV re-recordings. They're not calling out her direct attempts to redirect narratives and rewrite the truth. For an example, Sam Lansky really not pushing back on Taylor's perception of the cancellation at all in the Time Person of the Year article. Midnight's has received basically zero acclaim, but also zero critique, and I think this puts it in a really awkward position. There aren't even any quotable or interesting reviews of this record to mention here because they all did their own, wow, Taylor is doing pop again. We love Jack. Her success is really impressive. But success on its own, especially from a commercial standpoint, does not make an album excellent, nor is it even really something to be respected in isolation. There is organic and manufactured hype, and Midnight's relies heavily on the lore and the universe building of the Taylor's version project and the glamour of the Eras tour to market itself as something unique or interesting. I really don't think that it can stand on its own. So my main point about the cultural impact of Midnight's is that no one in their right mind would ever honestly look back on this body of work unless you were emotionally, personally attached to it. And if you are, that's totally good. I'm emotionally attached to all of Taylor Swift's work, but I'm also still able to maintain a bit of a remove and try and look at things objectively for a quality basis. But regardless, independent of the context to which it was arrived, you cannot look back on Midnight's nights and say that it was a career defining highlight for a noted prolific pop songwriter Taylor Swift. There are at least four other albums you would point to at first without even thinking at Midnight's. Let's take a look at her other albums that were actually nominated and won for album of the year and discuss their unique impact on Taylor and the industry at large. First of all, we have Fearless, The Blueprint, the genre crossing smash hit that spotlighted the importance of listening to teenage girls and taking their interests seriously. Teenage girls can sell records, teenage girls can do country music and teenage girls can write their own songs and they can write damn good songs too then we have 1989 her second album of the year win which is the culmination of a careful plan to do that full genre switch you can see the line from fearless to 1989 winning really clearly actually from an artist who had been very heavily marketed in another direction who managed to create these bulletproof timeless pop songs that took her to a new stratosphere of global stardom and to have not aged a day and then we have folklore which is taylor's return to her country sensibilities after the seismic 
a pop shift in the sense of narrative songwriting focused on intricacy and world making, working with a new collaborator, Aaron Dessner, to help her flirt with a different genre, the outskirts of pop music, adult contemporary, indie pop, whatever you want to call it, and also surprise release during a pandemic, capturing the public imagination. And with those reasons in mind, what reasons can you come up with for Midnight's? The subject matter is literally all familiar material. The production work is with the exact same people she's almost always made pop music with at this point. You can't tout its excellence without mentioning something other than the actual work itself. Put yourself through this exercise. What's the one career-defining song on Midnight's? For most albums, this is immediately clear. You don't even have to think about it. Or there are so many options that you have to debate them in your head before you write them down. Debut, Teardrops on My Guitar, Easily, Fearless, Love Story, Speak Now, Dear John, Last Kiss, Enchanted, Take Your Pick, Reputation, Look What You Made Me Do. Even lover has cruel summer folklore evermore where to start you turn to midnights and struggle to come up with a justification i'll get more into the specific songs later on but anti-hero is really not a defining career hit despite being a really successful chart topper it's not sonically different from an artistic standpoint from anything that she's put out and it's self-conscious but it's not self-aware she acknowledges a perception of her but doesn't interrogate it this is more effectively done on reputation for example it's half-baked. I'll get into Antihero more specifically when I compare it to All Too Well later on. Yeah, buckle up, that's coming. Okay, now let's talk about artistic excellence. Taylor Swift's greatest skill set, aside from being an excellent saleswoman, is her diaristic, confessional, and melodic pop songwriting. It's important to distinguish diaristic from confessional here. There are plenty of girlies out there who are trying to replicate the Taylor Swift songwriting model, and they are failing because they lean too heavily into the diaristic and not far enough into the confessional. Diaristic songwriting is frank or candid. The listener is led to believe they are hearing an intimate thought, something personal to the performer. Gracie Abrams is a diaristic songwriter. She writes about her feelings. But it's not enough to just write your feelings down when it comes to creating art. Your personal investment in it, whether it was scary or hard to write or felt very personal to you, is actually completely immaterial to whether that work becomes excellent or not. I would argue that what tips over diaristic songwriting into excellence is the confessional element. This is an intangible mix of performance, delivery, strategic vulnerability, and most crucially, cold, hard skill which many of these pop girlies don't have, but Taylor Swift does. Taylor Swift writes about her feelings, yes, but she does this in a manner that is both immediate and direct, making you feel like she's telling you a secret or creating a sense of intimacy with you while touching on a universal feeling that is widely applicable to everyone. So while you might not be able to relate to the specifics of what she's talking about, the overarching sense that she's trying to convey to you is immediately understood. And that's what makes her such a powerful songwriter. I'll illustrate the difference between a simply diaristic and a confessional Taylor Swift song using two of her own songs, All Too Well and anti-hero. Literally, it's like Godzilla versus Ratatouille. <laughs> the subject matter here is very different, obviously, but one of these songs works on two levels. It's diaristic and confessional, while the other one is merely diaristic and doesn't have the depth required to generate an insight. All Too Well is a masterclass in first-person songwriting. I'm going to reference an article by Joanna Novak for the Paris Review here. She wrote about how All Too Well is a masterclass use of present tense, and the use of present tense in songwriting or lyricism in general is an often debated literary tool. It can be viewed as a lazy short cut to creating intimacy, or it can be viewed as a powerful tool when harnessed right to remove distance between the writer and the reader, or the listener in this scenario, and create a really deep and true sense of intimacy. So the writer of this Paris Review article quoted someone called Janet Burroway, who said, the effect of the present tense somewhat self-consciously is to reduce distance and increase immediacy. The writer then says, when Swift ushers listeners through that door in the first line of All Too Well, the listener steps towards a perpetual present, a place where the overness of past love is never truly over. The subject matter here is really the problem, I think. All Too Well zeroes in on the historical experience of getting your heart broken and getting stuck in that heartbreak. Here she has successfully identified a universal feeling in one of her personal experiences and translated that effectively into a song. Antihero utilizes the same perspective as All Too Well in that it's first person and it also attempts to do a similar thing, which is make a personal experience, in this case it's being relentlessly criticized, which makes her feel bad about herself, and turn it towards the listener. But instead of creating an intimacy, I I would say that a song like Antihero, particularly in a moment like The Bridge specifically, firmly plants a greater distance between the listener and our narrator. Most of us are not thinking about how our daughters will deal with our very large estates after our death, and that train of thought is not really linked to any of the other thoughts that came before it. She's also not being confessional here, she's just simply being diaristic. Instead of interrogating why she looks directly at the sun instead of in the mirror, she simply just lets us know that she knows that she's doing it, as if to state a fact is to tell a truth or to confess a secret. It's not. 
And all too well, she's scathing but reflective and accountable too. Maybe we got lost in translation. Maybe I asked for too much. Most of Midnight's falls into this trap of disguising a truth as an insight. The lore does the heavy lifting here. The songwriting is left intentionally vague. We as the detectives are deployed to deliver meaning where there isn't any, or the writer has not successfully communicated it well enough to identify it specifically, leaving it up to endless interpretation. Notice how there's not a lot of discussion on what exactly a song like All Too Well, Cold As You, Dear John, or Would Have Coulda Should Have, which is the only truly excellent song from a writing perspective on Midnight's. There's no true discourse about what those songs are about. There's some debate about who they're about, but not what. Much of the discourse around Midnight's is centered around well, what experience is she describing here? The breadcrumbing of letting us know that it was about 13 sleepless nights definitely set us off on an Easter egg hunt, except the eggs were so well hidden or never hidden at all because they didn't exist, we haven't been able to retrieve them properly. Intentional vagueness is a disposition in the protagonist on this album that is so polar opposite from the narrator we've come to know and love that it's honestly jarring. The promise of a confessional album should yield a record that brings you closer to understanding the artist, but Midnight's only leads us further away from whoever this person is that we're talking about. I think there are two really good and pertinent examples of this intentional vagueness that we can discuss here, Question and Maroon. I'll start with Maroon, which is the biggest disappointment because I feel like it hinges on being a fantastic song. It stood out to me immediately at first, if you remember my reaction video, for the atmosphere that was being created by the production choices, which were rather interesting, especially compared to the rather one note flat production elsewhere on the album. But there is something very evocative here. But what exactly Taylor is trying to evoke is very difficult to pin down given the rambling prose. The chronology of the song is very difficult to parse. The jump from I chose you to I lost you is not connected by any visceral image. We go straight from we were having a good time partying in your room like two hooligans to you were crying in the hallway. Where is the intervening conflict? This is semi-descriptive, but it's not at all revealing. And the chorus doesn't really help us get any closer to an insight either. It's this hypnotic chant, a prayer almost. The burgundy on my t-shirt when you splash your wine into me and how the blood rushed into my cheeks so scarlet was maroon the mark you saw on my collarbones the rust agree between telephones the lips i used to call home so scarlet was maroon amen Amen. The rust that grew between telephones is a lyric that I really like here and kind of almost visually depicts the gradual disintegration of a connection. However, this is all kind of thrown off by the unclear refrain of this chorus. So Scarlet It Was Maroon is an interesting image. Perhaps it implies the aging of a passion, going from that burning red to a faded muted color, but the way it's presented and delivered does not really provide any answers. And don't get me wrong, a little mystery is more than welcome. And as a Swifty, one of my greatest pleasures is decoding a Taylor Swift mystery. But eventually, once you ring the towel out a million times, you start to realize there's no water left in it. And yet here you are still ringing it. I love Maroon. I think it's very evocative, as I mentioned, but it is not excellent. And many songs on Midnight's suffer the same confused fate, including one of my favorite songs on the record, Question. This is truly incomprehensible nonsense. Incomprehensible even to the most ardent of hailers. I think part of the construct of this song is that it's an incoherent rambling in the middle of the night, which would be fine if it was like a statement piece on the album that wasn't surrounded by other half-baked thoughts like Maroon. Did you ever have someone kiss you in a crowded room and everybody there was making fun of you, but 15 seconds later they were clapping too? This literally doesn't make sense. It rocks harder than anything I've ever heard in my entire life, but it makes no sense. It also doesn't help that Taylor has given us absolutely zero insight into the creative process for this album. She hasn't spoken to us about what it means to her or what challenges she faced while writing it, or even what her favorite songs are. This is very unusual. Even during Reputation, she recorded her speaking at length about the songs at the secret sessions and then broadcasted it on the radio. And the whole shtick for that album was there will be no explanation, there will just be reputation. I'm not talking to you bitches. You did me wrong. But her refusal to explain herself is yet more evidence to me that this album was simply a product of her hyperproductive era and not a well thought through artistic statement. And that is totally fine. It slaps. It rocks. But album of the year? It is not. The lyricism has been picked apart over and over again because of the intentional vagueness. Was this a strategy to simply manufacture endless social media speculation about the lore of it all? That's what fueled the Taylor mania. So maybe so. It would also explain why she's refused to speak about her intentions while creating Midnight's. I've talked about this record a lot as being a living and breathing thing and how with more and more context, it seems to become clearer. But again, it seems to become clearer. The best artistic statements are deeply and intuitively felt the moment you encounter them. Midnight's is no such record. To me, the most successful song from a writing perspective here that is with the clearest to follow story and structure is Mastermind. 
Album Closer. I understand, sonically, this is not the most approachable Taylor Swift song, nor is it the most face value good song on the record. We also have What Have Could Have Should Have, which I will get into in a minute. But I think that Mastermind straddles the balance very well between diaristic and confessional. She's talking about her proclivity to control the narrative and orchestrate encounters and scenarios that work in her advantage. And she mentions that being a woman is part of the reason why she feels that she has to do this and be one step ahead. But then she reveals her inner machinations behind this behavior. No one wanted to play with me as a little kid, so I've been scheming like a criminal ever since to make them love me and make it seem effortless. I'm only cryptic and Machiavellian because I care. The bridge of Mastermind goes where Antihero completely stops short and actually requires some self-reflection. It ends with her being and feeling seen for who she really is, a controlling warts and all, you knew the entire time I was the one and only Mastermind. But the best written song was not even included on the standard edition of the record. The fact that it had to be parsed away from the original track list reveals a lot to me about the canonical 13 songs. They were not intended to be clear or understood, nor was their selection particularly curated. It's important to remember that Taylor, I think from now what we know with You're Losing Me, she was going through a very turbulent time in her personal life and she was not ready to be honest about it, which is why the messaging feels very confused and unclear. And that's totally fine. I respect that. But then wait, <laughs> wait and release later or edit or explain that you were feeling confused. Do something, say something, risk something. I've got nothing to believe. Back to what have could have should have. This is the best case scenario of a lore informed song and the only true example of a midnight song that follows the sleepless nights conceit. She's ruminating over a situation that is long gone and we know of well as her audience. And she's reflecting in a manner that we haven't heard before. She's letting us know that it still haunts and plagues her. She second guesses what could have happened to her and her life if she had never endured this in the first place. And she delivers the absolute gut punch punch of living for the thrill of hitting you where it hurts, give me back my girlhood, it was mine first. And you know what this does? It clarifies something that we know about Taylor and it adds to our understanding of her artistry. Why did she take so much pleasure in publicly whacking this particular ex over the head in public for years on end? Because he took something from her that wasn't his to take and it's something she can never get back. But these moments of startling clarity are so few and far between on Midnight's that it's difficult to find another example. Other perpetual mysteries. Was Sweet Nothing a covert breakup song? Is it about Paul McCartney? Is Karma a character-driven song or is she being dead serious? Is Labyrinth about a recent or a distant reconciliation. We'll never know because it's not clear. I don't think the songs themselves contain the answers to these questions, and that's the problem. Some might point to You're On Your Own Kid as a career highlight, and I could see an argument being made for this, but I'm unsure. This is definitely a successful example of Taylor's lore building being described by Madeline, the co-host of Evolution of Snake, as the ultimate track five, encompassing elements of her entire journey and delivering a comforting, reassuring lullaby. This song is written more to us than from her, if that makes sense. It's meant to inspire, to uplift, to reassure, it's kind of like long live in that sense. And it does all of those things, absolutely. From a pure writing perspective though, I'm not convinced that it's strong enough to stand as a career highlight, divorced from the context of what Midnight's is as an album, though it is a personal favorite of mine. This song is diaristic, but it's not necessarily confessional. I overcame, I endured, I'm still here. It's wonderful, but is it excellent? I can honestly be swayed either way. So if you have a really powerful argument, share it with me in the comments. The other entries in this category this year are simply better formed artistic statements with very clear messages to impart. People go sicko mode at me when I say that I think Guts deserves over Midnight's, but I really think that it does. Watch my Guts video. Olivia's voice, tone, writing, and perspective is immediately clear in the brief 12 songs on that record. There's no need to plant Easter eggs or sit down and fight with the other Livies for months on end as to who or what Get Him Back is about. I think it's very condescending also, by the way, for Swifties to suggest that just because the music sounds young, it's automatically not excellent. So you're telling on yourself, so you think that Fearless didn't deserve Album of the Year. Because if we're just talking about thematically, that record is far more juvenile than Guts, and it's Taylor Swift's second album. That's just some food for thought, though. Taylor Swift is an accomplished artist with supreme talent, but that does not automatically make all of her work excellent. You may throw back at me, well, you said Lana's work is difficult to parse, and you think she deserves to win Album of the Year. And to that I say, well, yes, <laughs> that's part of Lana's artistry. In fact, it's who she's always been, an evasive narrator. It makes sense in the context of her career to create a work that's almost impossible to decode and bowl people over with that. In fact, it's a strengthening of her existing skill. My point is that Midnight's does not play to Taylor's strengths, nor does it introduce any new skills or cover any new territory. Taylor's 
refusal to talk about it is one thing, but I think the opacity surrounding the process is very curious too. This record was written on an incredibly short timeline. We're talking like three to four months, maybe a bit longer, give or take. She had previously spent in the era of making her best records, two to three years gathering life experiences before carefully collecting them and creating the theme or message with lessons that she wanted to impart. Folklore and Evermore didn't really need to follow this process as they were products of impulse and imagination, a skill completely in and of itself that's separate to her autobiographical writing. But I think what I can confidently say as a Taylor Swift historian is that her hyperproductive era, where she writes first and edits later, or never, releasing it as she goes, is better suited to her fictional material. The autobiographical stuff requires forethought, especially now that the Taylor Swift cinematic universe is so overcrowded, convoluted, and deep. Adding mixed messages into the canon and the lore runs the risk of it all going completely haywire, or further descending into deliberate misconstruals like Gaylorism due to the wishy-washiness and the refusal to commit to a narrative. So those are my reasons for why I don't think Midnight's deserves to win Album of the Year at the Grammys this year. What do you think? Keep it cute in the comments. As you all know, I love to use the block button. So if you're especially rude or if you want to cry your eyes out, take it somewhere else, girly. Take it somewhere else. But I will see you next week for the last installment of Grammy Month. And then we're going to be doing our Grammy reaction. I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm afraid of the discourse that's going to come online afterwards. I really am. But I'm also looking forward to it. Are you guys enjoying Grammy Month so far? Let me know down below and I will see you guys soon. And thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. You guys deserve to win Album of the Year, maybe. Maybe.